Well, it looks like the statue of General Edmund Car Kirby Smith, the Confederate General, is really being relocated from Washington, D.C., which I always call D.C. the District of Columbia, oh, not District of Columbia, District of Corruption, anyway, to Tavares, Florida, which is in Central Florida, north of Orlando. Uh, I'm actually in Florida, too, but as in Florida, the further north you go in Florida, the more south it gets, quote-unquote, or the more Dixie it gets. Uh, I'm actually north of Tavares in Florida. But uh, like, I want to make a few comments about this because um, it shows you the cowardice of the Republicans in, that are elected officials and... Um, in Washington, D.C., and also even in the state of Florida. 1922, the statue of General Edmund Kirby Smith was given to um, D.C. to be put on display there. Now, it's going to be relocated into Tavares, Florida, in a museum. I think it's part of a, a municipal complex with the police department and all that. It should be safe over there. Um, and personally, I really don't care that the statue of Kirby Smith is being relocated out of the District of Corruption anyway because I got no respect for the District of Cor Corruption that's Yankee territory so maybe we shouldn't have maybe Florida should have never freaking sent the statue up there in the first place and maybe it should have been located in Tallahassee but I am disappointed in Governor Rick Scott because he's just another one of those weenie Republicans that goes along with the flow they're like a weather vane whatever which way the weather vane Whichever which way the wind blows, that weather vane will go that in that direction. I believe it was the year 1963 that they put the battle flag of the Confederacy on the state capitol in Tallahassee. And I think it was taken down in probably 2001, I think it was, by um, Jeb Bush, the governor. Uh, the reason they put it up there, re-put it up there in the first place, is that the South was being encouraged by even a committee in, uh, in Congress to celebrate the centennial of the war between the states, or the war for Southern in attempt for war for Southern independence, and to celebrate various, you know, events. So in South Carolina, on April 1961, it was the hundred year anniversary of the firing on a tariff collection point, Fort Sumter, which is smack right in the middle of their harbor, which they told them to vacate, which they just Abe reinforced because he wanted the money. Um, and in 1963 was the 100 year anniversary of the Battle of Natural Bridge, where the Confederates uh, stopped the Yankees from taking over the state capital in Tallahassee. So that's why the flag was put up there. It wasn't anything to do with civil rights movement or anything. This is the media playing his game. Now, the one thing that the communists, I don't even want to call them, you know, I'm a liberal because I'm really, if you know, if you really look at some of the things, liberal in a true sense, I mean, they threw that word around so weird that it's not even meaning what it means. Like, in other words, Thomas Jefferson was a true liberal. Um, it's got a different meaning today. Now it means... Uh, you're a big government know-it-all. You know, you, you want you're just you want to control everybody's lives. To be liberal means to actually be freedom thinking and allow people to do what the hell they want, as long as you're not harming anybody else. Basically, you know, just abide by the Ten Commandments and um, the Bill of Rights, the original Bill of Rights that protect our own individual rights. That's good. I mean, all these other rules are kind of ridiculous. You know, most of them anyway. Um, Thomas Jefferson was like a true liberal if you really think of it you know they just took this word and they hijacked it um he was a guy that really you know, was against the big government now what the confederates really fought against was big centralized control of government that's why they're breaking away and everybody freaking points out slavery but you know even that was a scam reason that they were hoping that the north wouldn't notice because <laughs> they did notice they noticed it later, though. They said the North started figuring out, hey, wait a minute, if the South leaves, we're going to lose most of our freaking tax revenue. And that's when they said, they can't leave. <laughs> and that's when, that's basically when the war effort started. Um, now, if you look who's really behind the war between the states, you know, okay, it was Abe Lincoln. Okay, he was pushing. I mean, that's the guy you see on the front. But 
He was an attorney for the railroads. The railroads, the big railroads at that time, were the biggest industry in the United States. As a matter of fact, after the war between the states was over, there was a major railroad boom. You know, everything was union, 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 but basically it had to do with the robber barons had full control over everything. And actually, the robber barons were making a lot of money even during the war between the states. Even J.P. Morgan, who initially supported um, you know, the Union and Abe Lincoln, when he was 24 years old, he made a statement that he was, kind of, he was fed up with um, you know, the war profiteers that were all around Lincoln and also in his administration. Now, Lincoln wasn't 100% bad because the real reason he got assassinated was because he issued greenbacks and he was going to get us away from you know, being controlled by the central banks. That's really when assassination happened to him. Same kind of reason that happened with JFK. What did he do? Now, I mean, that's not the only reason, but you know, JFK was getting us away from the Federal Reserve and he was getting silver certificates backed by actual silver. Um, what happened though after the war between the states was the biggest benefactors were the robber barons and the most wealthy. And that's really why they had to get the South back in the Union. You know, I mean, Abe Lincoln says, yeah, he was there to preserve the Union. It wasn't about slavery. He says this, but you're thinking, why is he out there to preserve the Union? Is this some kind of thing? I just like the Union? No, it had to do with money because the big, too bigs to fail just like you got today in 2008 and 2009 with bailouts, you know, what would have happened to a lot of these other industrial uh, mega banking giants if they didn't get bailed out with trillions of dollars from the U.S. government, they would have went under. Well, the same kind of deal was going on even before the war between the states because this is what led up to the war between the states. The big railroads are being heavily subsidized by the U.S. federal government with you know, uh, land grants and you know, infrastructure spending. Actually, the Confederate Constitution actually put major limits on infrastructure spending. They also put major limits. They also said that loans couldn't be forgiven. So, in other words, you can't have bailouts. <laughs> you can't have a bailout. In other words, you have a bailout to something, you're going to have to pay it back. You know, th these bailouts in 2008, 2009 would have been totally unconstitutional under the Confederate Constitution. These are just a few of the aspects. But you can see one of the big benefactors of the war between the states was the big money up north. So like 33,000 miles of railroad track got built between, you know, the 1865 and 1873 with this tremendous railroad building boom that was heavily financed by the federal government with land grants which they stole from the American Plains Indians and all this. And um, they, you know, they and it led to such a freaking boom that it led to a bust and that actually led to the demonetization of silver so uh, it was a way they can kind of issue funny money from the government and you know keep everything afloat the time of the robber barons was actually from the late well from the 1860s which is actually during the war between the states because the robber barons were making money then in the north and up to about 1920 and this is heavily documented with the muckrakers, the yellow just journalism. I don't know, if maybe they had problems with advertising or unfriendly back then. I don't know how much I could talk about this stuff today, but, you know, I'm trying to put it out in a lighthearted manner, but just give you the facts. But this is why today they got the money powers have a problem with any Confederate symbology. So even these Republicans, who are supposedly quote-unquote conservative, whatever the hell that means, are like, you know, oh, we got to get this statue of this Confederate general out of Washington, D.C. Well, it was in there since 1922. Where the hell were you Where the hell were you for the freaking last almost 100 years? You know, if it was so bad, how come it was to put there in the first place, you know? I mean, come on. I mean, there was a Republican president in 1922 and 1923, four or five, all the way up to, you know, Hoover. And then, you know, I mean, I mean, up to... Um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt came in in 1933, in the beginning, right, in March, he was inaugurated. I think they were inaugurated in March versus January back then. But, you know, come on, come on, I mean, what's the problem? Why all of a sudden is this a pro you know what I mean? These guys, these guys are basically, politicians are like worthless, man. I mean, it's like, 
I mean, it's like taking a piece of tissue paper and you expect they're going to protect your rights. They're going to, you know, first little breeze that comes along, the tissue paper's like, eh, done. That's how politicians are. They're out there for the number one. And they follow whatever, you know, the media says. So I'm like little media. So maybe I'm doing a little dent against them, a little bing, throwing a pebble at them. But, um, you know, I want to educate more of the American people as to what's really going on with this issue. You know, they don't want you looking into Confederate, I mean, there's Confederate symbols and these people, you know, it burns me up too sometimes. They say, heritage, no hate. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I know it's not supposed to be hateful, but the heritage thing is not really why <laughs> the South said, you know, we're going to make this Constitution and put all the brakes on spending in the federal government. Basically, the South, now I'm actually, it looks like I'm going through 100%, I got all the documentation, it's just waiting to be approved and stuff, you know, at the final steps. I'm going to be a member of the Sons of the American Revolution, 1776. You see what's going to happen eventually, after these communists, whatever, the big, lo big, lo big government loving communists uh, that know it all and want to tell you everything there is about how you should live that's not liberal okay and I'm not a conservative because these conservatives are like yeah you gotta pay this and that you yeah, worship the government and I'm not into that either but the um, you know after this is all sorted out I think what's gonna happen is that you know government is in other words they're gonna be going after 1776 they're not going to stop with Confederate symbols. They're going to, because 1776 and 1861, 1861 actually was more of a reason to have, you know, trying to break away than 1776. You know, 1776 was, you know, okay to tea tax, but it was really the coercive laws or the coercive acts passed by the Parliament in the UK and the gun confiscation rules and stuff. It, that really led to the revolution. It wasn't really the Tea Party. The Tea Party was like a spark and that led to the course of acts and the course of acts really pissed off the colonists and the you know the, the, the British tried to disarm the colonists and that's when it started to a shooting war. Now with the Confederacy, okay you had first seven states secede. I know they said in your con in your some of the things they mentioned slavery but slavery was not the issue it was taxation. It was really Slavery was basically legalized 100% by the Supreme Court with the Dred Scott decision, even in 1857, three years prior to South Carolina seceding. It was all legalized. They had in 1850 the Slave Fugitive Act passed by Congress, for crying out loud. Slavery wasn't threatened in the South, the institution of it. The South brought up this phony reason because the real reason was, you know, like J.P. Morgan also once said, you know, a man has a good sounding reason for saying something, and also the real reason. Usually the real reason is money. Now, you might think, well, okay, they were trying, the North wasn't trying, the North didn't invade the South to, to free the slaves. As a matter of fact, after the first seven states seceded, the North offered, along with Abe Lincoln's support, and they had it almost all ready to go through, and had everything all, you know, they had widespread support, it was the Corwin Amendment, which is going to make slavery permanently constitutionally protected in the South. So this was after um, you had South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, the first seven states in that order seceded. Then, when Virginia got attacked, Robert E. Lee, who was actually uh, he was part of the American government, you know, he was he was in the military officer in the American government. He decided, you know, to go on the Confederacy because they attacked his home state, which is like states were considered autonomous. Even in the Confederate Constitution, they really laid that out and spelled it out more so than it was in the U.S. Constitution, even though the Founding Fathers knew that it meant each state had its own autonomy and that the federal government was not going to have that much control over the states. But it was more than that. It was like, now if you look at what happened as a result of the war between the states, the, um, <coughs> the, the robber barons got full, full reign. The railroads, you know, Vanderbilt, 
Now you look at Anderson Cooper, you know, he's the descendant of Vanderbilt, you know, he's a big media guy, right? And you also have um, Carnegie with the steel mill, steel being part of the, uh, that's my clock going off, by the way, it's a little Christmas gift I had from one years ago, you hear that in the background. The, uh, you know, Carnegie with the steel mills, which is also related to the uh, railroad industry. Now, that wasn't the only industry that benefit, like Mellon with Mellon Bank. And this is where these uh, robber barons really got a lot of steam. They got steam from the war itself, you know, because the people in the north paid them for the mechanizations, the machinery and weapons to fight the war. And after the war, they had this big, big railroad boom, and the robber barons got filthy rich. And actually, ever since this time, ever since the war between the states, um, it's been, you know, World War I, we didn't really need to get involved in that, and that actually led to, um, you know, such a bad treaty with that Germany, and bad economic conditions in Germany, that it caused, it helped this Adolf guy to come about, which created, you know, the Holocaust, and the Holocaust, not of Jews, but also Polish Catholics and Jews, and Holocaust of Russians fighting the Nazis and the Germans suffered. I mean, all this garbage happened. If you start thinking about it, all this stuff wouldn't have happened if the Confederates actually were able to, to secede from the Union. And the U.S. at large would have still been protected because there would have been a mutual treaty between the North and South for mutual defense. Just like, I mean, for crying out loud, we got a treaty with Canada. If one of us is attacked, we're going to come to the other one's rescue, right? I mean, why, we got the same kind of deal. Nothing's going to change there. So, it was really a war to benefit the big powers and money. So every time they're, they're knocking down or taking away one of these statues, it's really what it's for. And they're con artists with, you know, telling you the, the reason for the war between the states. They used the slave issue, but the slave issue, you know, some people say it was a major issue, but it was a major issue in that um, slavery was attached to agricultural activities at the time. In other words, if they had developed farm tractors and all these farm machineries, it, it was the it was the agricultural activity that was being affected by the tariffs because the USA was exporting a lot of agricultural items and that's where the tariffs were collected on import of in exchange for them from goods from Europe and that was protecting the northern industries. So, you know, I mean, it's like they play games with the whole nine yards all the way through when they're not giving you the whole nine, the whole deal. And actually, if you're looking at the last five states that seceded, which was, was Virginia, Arkansas, well, wait a minute, you know, it depends on how you look at it, <laughs> actually four states and then two more, Virginia, Arkansas, North Carolina, and Tennessee seceded because their sister states were attacked. And then, of course, Missouri seceded, but then it got taken over by the Union early in the war, and Alex, Kentucky seceded. So they were basically claimed by you know, the Confederacy. As a matter of fact, even Delaware would have probably seceded, but Maryland actually seceded. <laughs> Believe it or not, Maryland was voting to secede from the Union and Abe Lincoln had all the legislatures arrested and thrown in jail so they couldn't vote to secede from the Union. Because if Maryland seceded from the Union, you would have D.C., the District of Corruption, right smack in the middle, and it would have been, you know, the only way you can get into D.C. would be through, not Confederate, you know, it wouldn't be going through Confederate territory, it would be by boat, and that would have been the end of the North right there. Actually, if Maryland seceded, Delaware would have went. And actually, in New Jersey, Lincoln lost both times, the election, both times. That was kind of like a far closer contest than you think, believe it or not. And today, you know, I look at the representations out there of these Confederate, um, you know, symbols. I look at them as living representations for limited government exactly as our founding fathers envisioned. So, you know, people that are disparaging these symbols and throwing dirt on them are basically, you know, 
first off, I'd have to say is where were you freaking 20, 50 years ago, whatever, you know? These people, oh, all of a sudden, yeah, everything's up, well, times have changed, so get out of here. These politicians are like, you know, a weather vane or a sail in the wind. They just catch whichever way that things are going best for them, they, they assume. But I think there's an undercurrent of popular movement that's arising in the face of this. And, um, yeah, who the hell knows? Rick Scott, I don't like him, okay? I mean, he's a Republican, but he's basically the classic carpetbagger on steroids. He's, a, you know, that's my opinion of this guy. I mean, uh, Trump, I mean, what do you, I mean, I don't know how good he is or bad. I don't think he's like what he said he was going to be when he got, you know, he's, he was going around with his campaign promises, oh, make America great. We're probably heading over to financial cliffs right now pretty soon and he's probably gonna have mud on his face on that not because it's Trump but that's just the way things are going but I knew hey I ain't gonna take the wicked witch of the West Hillary and voted for her you know so I mean I'm throwing a little modern politics in here but if you look back before the war between the states politics was way more complicated you know it was really it was really complicated so don't think you know Things have changed that much. They haven't, really. So, over and out, just want to say that, you know, the statue of General Kirby Smith, Edmund Kirby Smith, moving out of D.C., maybe it's a good thing because, you know, personally, if I had my way, I'd start a movement of all the former Confederate states getting together and putting up special tolls for Yankees coming down this way on the I-95. <laughs> and then they can use that toll money, not, not anybody that lives in North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, or any of the states like that were Confederate, you know, Georgia, <laughs> Florida. Just, you know, the Yankees coming down, right? You know, use the high-tech stuff here. We can see your license plate says New York, New Jersey. Get a toll, and then use that money to put Confederate statues and flags and museums up along to, you know, beautify all the South. Show them just how proud we are of limited government. Not just heritage, you know. Limited government and what we really stood for and what we fought for. So over and out. Just want to leave you with that thought. <laughs> but that's how I think, man. You know, I'd probably get in trouble if I was up there and being a congressman, but I ain't ever going to be a congressman. I'll tell you that. Oh, no way. <laughs> anyway, over and out.